Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2022 Nirenberg Lectures in Geometric Analysis, who are, which are hosted by the CRM. And we're happy to be back in presence with uh, two exceptional speakers, Lu Wang and uh, Jacob Bernstein. And uh, first two lectures will be given by Lu Wang and um, the second by Jacob Bernstein. And let me introduce the, today's speaker. Uh, so Professor Lu Wang from Yale University has received her PhD in 2011 from MIT. She spent uh, several uh, years on different positions, uh, very prestigious at uh, MSRI, at the Institute for Advanced Studies, University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Johns Hopkins University, uh, Cal State. Uh, and uh, in fact, she made professor at Cal State in 2019, and then she moved to Yale University in 2021. Um, she is a former Sloan Fellow and um, also uh, a recently ICM speaker at the last uh, International Congress of Mathematicians. So without further ado, I'd like uh, to uh, let uh, uh, Luang speak about an excursion into mean curvature flow. All right, so um, thanks the organizer for the kind invitation and uh, thank Alina for the introduction. So I'm going to just uh, give a very brief guide to the uh, mean curvature flow. Um, the outline of the talk is that, so I will first uh, uh, introduce mean curvature flow by giving the definition and um, some basic properties. And I will talk about uh, curve shortening flow, which is a one dimensional mean curvature flow. And uh, for which we have a pretty complete understanding of uh, the behavior of the flow. And so then we move on to the higher dimensional case uh, where the situation is more complex and we'll focus on the singularity formations. And we will see that uh, uh, how the flow behave uh, near a uh, singularity. And then last, I will talk about uh, weak solutions and the uh, uh, related topic on the singularity variation uh, in Euclidean space. So uh, this graph is going to input on a mean curvature flow. Uh, that means that the velocity of every point on the evolving hypersurface is given by the mean curvature vector. So the picture here, um, it is a, a numerical illustration uh, of uh, this uh, convex curve uh, evolving under the flow. Okay, so, so, so as you see from the picture, so the, the, the curves become uh, more and more circular as it uh, shrinks. So since it's actually numerical simulation, so it's uh, only approximate the behavior of the flow. So in particular, so in, 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 in rigorous sense, so the flow will not actually become a circle in finite time. But when you zoom in uh, near, uh, as, as time goes, so then you will see this uh, uh, near round circle appear in the, in, in the flow. So um, this is a um, picture or numerical simulation is uh, used by courtesy of uh, David Epstein. So a mean curvature flow um, can be uh, studied from a, a various viewpoint. So for, for instance, so one can derive this uh, flow uh, as a solution to some uh, nonlinear heat equation. So which is like uh, the, 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 the the partial x partial t is equal to Laplacian x. But notice that the Laplacian here is not a Laplacian uh, on the Euclidean space, but rather it's restricted to the evolving hypersurface. That's make the equation a nonlinear instead of a linear heat equation. So nonetheless, they, they, they share a lot of uh, nice properties with the standard uh, linear heat equation. Okay. And another way to uh, think about um, mean curvature flow is uh, from this uh, variational viewpoint. So namely it is a L2 gradient flow for the area functional. So uh, in particular, so if we know that the flow is compact, so then the area of the flow, it is uh, finite. So then one can compute the derivative, the rate of the change of the area of the evolving hypersurfaces under the flow, and you get this nice formula, which is equal to minus of the integral of the square of the mean curvature vector. Okay, so hence, so minimal surfaces, so those surfaces has a, a vanishing mean curvature vector, 
everywhere. So a stationary solution because the velocity is zero. So it's not a move under the flow. Now, these are some um, basic property for this uh, mean curvature flow. And so starting from a uh, smooth, uh, close hypersurfaces, so one can always uh, apply the flow and uh, for a short amount of time. And, but so in general, so, um, so the flow will develop singularities uh, always. Okay, so let's take a look at the one dimensional case. So at first, so let's just consider a convex closed simple curve uh, in the plane, right? So, so, so then by uh, classical results of uh, gauge Hamilton, so you can see that, so the curve is going to contract under the flow, but it remains smooth and convex. And it will eventually uh, disappear at a round point. So for instance, one can just take a, uh, this convex closed curve, uh, take a, you know, the, the circle, the round circle as an example of this convex closed curve, right? So then, so if you have a circle, right? So, so, so let's suppose the circle is the uh, radius R. So each point on this circle will have a mean curvature pointing towards the center of the circle and with a magnitude equal to one over R. So, so then, so the circle will be uh, shrink under the flow and this uh, remain spherical. And as it's a shrink, you get a smaller circle and smaller circle has a larger mean curvature. So in this case, in one D case, the mean curvature then is equal to the curvature, the Gauss curvature. So, so then in finite time, so you're going to see that, uh, so the radius of the circle shrink to zero. So in the meantime, so the curvature of the circle blows up. So that's a typical example. But this is a uh, gauge Hamilton theorem says that not only for circle, because for circle, you can use the symmetry to see that it's a remissive spherical, then you can reduce this uh, mean curvature flow equation to an ODE to solve it directly. So in general, so if you consider arbitrary complex closed curve, then it's impossible to actually write down a solution in a closed form to, to prove the theorem. So they have to use uh, other technique, uh, for instance, like a maximum principle to prove this kind of a theorem. So this is about the convex curve. So, so, so a natural follow-up to uh, a question to consider is to uh, try to understand what happens if we drop the convexity assumption. So just to consider some closed curve, simple closed curve in a plane and try to understand how this curve evolves under the curve shortening flow. So nowadays it's known that uh, by this uh, Grayson's theorem that uh, so this closed curve in a plane will actually evolve uh, and remain smooth and become a convex curve in finite time. So after it's become a convex curve, the convexity is preserved under the flow, then using the gauge Hamilton theorem, you see it's going to remain convex and disappear at a wrong point. So, so this theorem, it is uh, quite a striking theorem. So because the closed simple curve in plane could be very complex in geometry. So, so, so for instance, so let's see, so if you draw something like this, so this could be an example of a closed simple curve, right? So, and so under this Grayson theorem, so, so this curve is going to just un, try to unwind itself because so the curvature at the tip is very large. So then it's going to push inward. So then it's going to gradually unwind this curve. And in finite time, you see this spiral has become uh, some convex curve, and then it's going to uh, reduce the cage Hamilton situ situation, okay? So here we only consider uh, embedded curves, but you could also consider immersed curve, then that is uh, more complicated, yeah. So, so basically we have a pretty uh, 
nice theory about the you know curve shortening flow, namely the one-dimensional mean curvature flow. So it will be natural to ask the whether we can generalize this uh, one-dimensional mean curvature flow picture to higher dimension. So uh, in general, so the, this is uh, something uh, impossible and the, because one can <clears throat> try to think about some example like this. So one draw a two uh, ball, right? So, and then you remove a small disk on each of this ball. And then you draw them by a thin map, right? So, so now imagine like uh, if you focus on the, the region of this uh, large ball, so then, so it's, it's, it's mean curvature is going to be uh, much smaller than if we focus on the neck region, right? So because the, the mean curvature of the neck is going to proportional to the, uh, to the radius of the, the cross section, which is uh, one of the cross section, which is much larger. So, so as you flow, so you imagine, so this neck becomes thinner, thinner, and the sphere also shrink, but this uh, shrink in a much slower speed. So, so in finite time, you're going to see that this, before this sphere shrink to the center, as in the example of the, you know, the circle, which is also work for higher dimension. So then this uh, neck region going to shrink to its axis uh, uh, in, in a faster speed, right? So, so then you see the singularity going to develop uh, even before the surfaces disappear in any uh, low dimensional object, okay? So this example shows that, so this uh, uh, simple pictures in curve shortening flow case is not going to uh, hold in higher dimension. So however, so, so this example, uh, you, can, you can actually restrict to uh, a smaller class of hypersurface in higher dimension. For instance, if you restrict to uh, convex hypersurfaces, then the gauge Hamilton results uh, uh, still holds true, so the proof is a completely different uh, given by the scheme. But in general, so uh, higher dimension, the mean curvature flow behave more uh, in a more complex way. So, so then the focus of the study uh, in you know for the higher dimension mean curvature flow. Um, is on this uh, singularity formations. So the two, uh, we're going to study the singularities in mean curvature flow is uh, this uh, blow up analysis. So let's take a mean curvature flow on MT and then take a sequence of a point. So uh, this XI is the point we you can use our fun fun. So in the sequence of numbers, rho i uh, that tend to infinity. So then we can uh, define the blow up sequence of the flow at uh, at zero t zero uh, to be the sequence of this flow uh, given by this m t i. So, which basically says that you uh, translate your flow in space time to by this xiti, and then you dilate in time and in spatial direction simultaneously by rho i. But uh, so the factor is uh, different uh, in time and in space because the heat equation has this uh, scaling property that. Uh, so that's a, you, you, you know that if you scale your space by rho, then you need to scale your time accordingly by uh, rho minus two, right? So to make, uh, yeah, so it's a scaling invariant um, equation, right? So, so basically this MTI is like a, you, don't, you, you look at your original flows centered at SITI uh, in a uh, zoom in the scale, okay? So, so if any uh, subsequential limits of this MTI exist, we will call the limit uh, a limit of flow at x0, t0, okay? 
So in, in principle, uh, as we're going to talk about weak solutions, so this uh, subsequential limit uh, always exists. And the limit flow is called the limit flow is because it's also weak solution to mean curvature flow. Yeah. So then the, the, the question is to understand this limit flow. If we can understand the limit flow, then we can say a lot about the asymptotic behavior of the original flow near this point x0, t0. And what we really interested is that when the x0, t0 is where the original flow has a curvature blow up, but this analysis is not restricted to those points. It's, uh, you don't even need to restrict this x, i, t, i, or x0, t0 to be a point on the flow. So it just works everywhere. But uh, most, we're mostly interested in the case that when x0, t0 is where the flow becomes singular. All right, so in general, to understand this limit flow is a challenging uh, question. So, uh, but uh, we have a, a lot of a recent uh, development in the classification of limit flow under various conditions. And that's, uh, I, may, I, I, may, I may mention some uh, at the end or the talk tomorrow. Okay. So, so let's, um, then look at some special case. Uh, so when we have this uh, x i t i, they are all equal to this x zero t zero. So so for that case, we can understand the limit of flow uh, much better uh, thanks to this uh, Huisken's Bonatisi formula. So so this formula consider the rate of the change of this weighted uh, area. So, so the, the weight, it is uh, this uh, backward heat kernel uh, phi and center at at zero uh, with scale T zero, okay? So then by direct uh, compute the rate of the change of this uh, weighted integral and it satisfy uh, this, uh, this uh, this identity here, okay. So so the so the in, the, the, the integrand on the right hand side, uh, besides the weight, it is uh, this uh, vari variation of this uh, mean curvature vector on the surfaces. So it is important to notice that uh, this is also some uh, formula that is uh, uh, scaling invariant. So it's uh, make it uh, useful for the study of the singularity analysis. So from this uh, formula, uh, one can see that, so if we choose this uh, sequence of points in space-time x i t i, so they are all equal to the same point x zero t zero. So then this uh, subsequential limit, if exists, so going to satisfy this uh, um, structure equation, which reads that, so the t time slice is given by the uh, scaling of the minus one time slice by square root of minus t. So this means that, so this uh, limit, which is a family of uh, hypersurfaces with possibly singularities, that is like, a, it is the shape is the same, but you just uh, uh, dilate some time slice, right? So, so, so hence uh, we call such limit is a self-similar shrinking. And so uh, this was originally uh, proved by Huskin. So under the assumption that uh, we somehow uh, know the uh, sexual limit exists under some curvature blow up a rate assumption. And also we know that limit uh, is smooth. And so it's a generalized uh, to some weak limits set up. So by human and the white, uh, later on. And so the time t equal to minus one slice, uh, so it's really called a self shrinker. But sometimes uh, we're going to abuse notation to call the entire family NT be the self shrinker. Okay. So there are actually, uh, we're going to see in tomorrow's lecture that there are actually infinitely many self shrinkers. So it's actually uh, virtually impossible to classify all the self shrinkers as otherwise we would expect, right? We would hope, right? So if we 
classify all the self shrinkers, but this procedure means that we classify all the singularity models. So then that would be helpful uh, for our understanding of the flow near the singularities. Uh, but uh, we're not uh, uh, that e lucky. So, so we have to um, came up with some other idea. So for instance, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Forget, um, before we go that, so I wanna mention another important uh, question related to this follow-up analysis. So here we take a, a subsequential limit. So it is a, a important question to understand the wider we can improve this uh, subsequential limit to a full limit. So the, the period slides, so we see that, uh, so, so this uh, limit NT a prime depends on the choice of the subsequence of this NTI, right? So, so however, so under certain circumstances, one can improve this uh, subsequential limit to a full limit means that, so no matter which subsequence of this MTI you pick, so you always end up the same uh, uh, self-shrinker. So uh, this was known um, in the following case. So first, so uh, if we know the shrinker, it is a compact, so then this is approved by uh, Felix Schroes uh, in 2014. Or if we know the shrinker, it is a generalized cylinder, then this is a proof by Cody Minikazi, uh, 2015. And the very recently, Jonathan Drew gave an uh, alternative proof to this fact. And so um, and we also know that this is true when the shrinker is uh, asymptotic conical. Right, so this is proved by Troller Shows 2021. Okay, so um, so in 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 most of these proofs, so they um, more or less to uh, establish this uh, Loisius Simon type inequality, which can tell you how fast this uh, sub subsequent uh, how fast the subsequence of MTI is going to approach this limit. So if one know the rate of the convergence, then that's going to imply the uniqueness of this uh, the limit. So hence improve this uh, subsequent limit to full limit. So for instance, so uh, in the case that, uh, so uh, the shrinker is asymptotic conical, that uh, has a nice consequence that, so then this means that the singularity X0, T0 will be isolated in the, uh, backward in time parabolic neighborhood. So it means that, uh, so you look at uh, this point in space time, so you can't have other singularities that are approaching to this x0, t0 uh, from uh, backward in time. So, so this gives you some structure of the singular set of the uh, flow, okay? So that's one nice application. And for this uh, generalized similar case, then you can actually, uh, Cody Minikowski actually proved that, so uh, if a priori you know the flow only has this type of singularity, so then the singular set, uh, it has to be some, uh, uh, some, uh, some Lipschitz curve plus some uh, uh, countably many points. So, so usually this kind of a uniqueness result of the blow up limits can tell you uh, something about the structure of the singular set. So, okay, so, so, so now let's back to the shrinkers. So as I mentioned, so um, there's no hope to classify the shrinkers. So, but uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, if we can restrict the possibility of the singularity models, then we could uh, actually use flow to get some applications, for instance, questions in topology, like uh, Richie Flow did. So the simplest uh, self-shrinkers are these uh, planes, round spheres, and generalized cylinders. This can be easily checked uh, by, you know, um, yeah, better equations. Okay, so, so there's a conjecture. So now they uh, usually attributed to uh, Agnantrop, Eumannan, and uh, Huiskin. So which says that uh, consider a mean curvature flow starting from a generic flow surface in R3, 
So then the flow develops only spherical and cylindrical similarities. Even though a priori you, you start the mean convergence flow from arbitrary surface, so it may be kind of a very complex uh, similarity model. Then you only have this uh, uh, simple ones, namely the spherical or cylindrical ones. To study this conjecture, so it's important to consider this the notion of entropy for hypersurfaces. Uh, defined by coding Minikazi, so uh, which is uh, denoted by lambda of m, and is uh, taking supremum of this Gaussian surface areas uh, with a varying the center x zero and the scales t zero. So we talk about more about this entropy in tomorrow's lecture because it's related. But uh, uh, you can see that the so what after this the supremum signs so resemble. Uh, this quantity in Huskin's monotisic formula, right? Okay, so basically using this notion of entropy, so when there's a recent development uh, towards this uh, uh, generic mean conjecture, um, though we haven't really uh, solved it, but uh, uh, we did have some important progress that I will talk about tomorrow. Okay, so, so this is about uh, uh, singularity formations in uh, a mean curvature flow. Okay, so uh, next question uh, is that whether we can somehow continue the flow through the singularities. So namely, whether there's a, a suitable weak notion of a, a mean curvature flow, right? So like uh, you have some like nonlinear PDE, and then you know the classical solution will stop exist uh, at some time then naturally you want to consider some weak notion, weak solution, right? So um, there are actually uh, several, uh, um, several different um, weak notions for mean curvature flow. And um, here I mentioned a couple of them that was related to uh, the talks uh, for the rest of the week. So, so first uh, is this bracket flow. Okay, so, um, so a bracket flow, so it is a family of this mirrors, mu t. Okay, so that satisfy this uh, variational inequality. So basically you take some test function phi, which has a nice uh, regularity property. So it's, in this case, we take a phi to be a C2 function. And we require it to be non negative and uh, compact supported. Okay. And so then the left hand side is the difference of this uh, integral of phi against uh, uh, this mirror in this family. So t1 is the time uh, before t2. So then you can uh, bound this difference from above uh, by the right hand side integral. So uh, this H, it is a generalized uh, uh, mean curvature on this, uh, uh, on this mirror. So, and so this uh, D perp is like, uh, you consider the um, differ differentiation of a phi, but then you take the, uh, the normal part. So yeah, so that is, so we don't need to worry about the precise meaning of this inequality. So, but uh, you, you can just uh, try to understand. So why is for the weak notion of mean curvature flow? For instance, if you have a classical mean curve flow MT, so then you can define this mirror mu T to be the n-dimensional house of mirror that's uh, supported on uh, MT whenever MT exists. And then you define mu T to be zero otherwise. So then you can check that uh, this um, mu t is going to uh, satisfy this uh, variational inequality. Okay. Right. So, so the advantage of this bracket flow is that it has a nice compactness property. So in general, if you just consider a family, you know, a set of uh, mean curvature flow, class of mean curve flow, then you may not be able to take a limit in the classical sense. So the classical mean curve needn't to be converged to 
some classical mean curve flow. You can just take a circle example, right? So you let the circle radius shrink to zero, then you take a limit, then you don't get the classical mean curve flow, right? So, so but the, however, so for a bracket flow, so if you consider set of bracket flow that under some very weak assumption on the uh, bound of uniform bound on the on the mass of the mirror, so then you can see that so you can almost always like uh, sub, you know abstract some uh, uh, limits. So in in other in other words, so so that is uh, compact, right? So this is the uh, crucial. Uh, in this uh, blow up analysis that we mentioned before. So, so we said that, uh, so whenever we can take the subsequent limits, then it's called limit flow. Now, if using this bracket flow notion, then you know you can always take a subsequent limit. And the limits of flow, it is a bracket flow. So, however, so the disadvantage of this bracket flow is because. Uh, we require inequality instead of uh, equality. So we're necessary because we have to allow some mass drop when, if we want to have this compactness theorem holds, right? So it's a it's kind of it's kind of some like a semi lower com, uh, lower semi continuity property that uh, we need, right? So so because of this inequality, right? So even consider classical flow MT. So we could just truncate MT, you know, at any time we want. And so then we still get a, a bracket flow starting from the same initial data, right? So there's a, a generally no uniqueness for the bracket flow starting from a given initial data, okay? Besides bracket flow, one can also try to think about uh, hypersurface as a level set of functions. So this will give rise to the level set flow. So, so consider a function defines on this uh, space time. And so let's think about uh, each level set of this function. It is a move by its mean curvature vector. So then that's going to give rise a uh, equation that this function satisfies which is uh, read in this last, the partial u partial t is equal to uh, du times the divergence of du over the norm of du, right? So the du divided by the norm of du, it is exactly the normal to the level set of u, right? So then you take a divergence give the mean curvature and the partial u partial t divided by the norm of du, that's exactly the, uh, using the implicit function, you see that's exactly the, uh, the normal part of the velocity. So, so as long as the norm of the du is not zero, so, so then this is exactly uh, saying that level set of du uh, move by mean curvature. So of course, so the difficulty is to deal with that. So then the du could be actually zero. So is then you have to uh, uh, refer to this uh, uh, viscosity solution to make sense of this uh, uh, de degenerate uh, PDE. Okay. And uh, for technical reasons, so we uh, assume this uh, U is a constant outside the compact set. So because we just interested in that like, uh, initial data to be uh, closed surfaces. So, and so it doesn't hurt to uh, ignore what happened uh, uh, outside large set. Okay, so, right. So, 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 so by the early work of uh, Chen, Giga, Goto, and Evan Sprock in the 90s, so under the uh, assumption that the initial function is uh, uh, Lipschitz, then you can actually show that, uh, so this U is always the exist, and then we call the zero level set of U uh, a level set flow. You can actually take a other uh, value as well, but uh, uh, for simplicity, we just take the zero level set. So one can show that uh, this level set flow uh, coincides with mean curvature flow as long as the latter exists. So hence it justifies the uh, reasonable weak notion for mean curvature flow. Okay. And so um, the advantage of the level set flow is that, uh, so it is uh, exists for a long time and is unique. 
So, however, so disadvantage of this uh, <coughs> level set flow is that so so in theory you would hope that the level set of function is like a, some one dimensional lower co-dimension one object. So, however, there's a famous example by uh, Evan Sprague, so that you consider uh, something like this, like a finger eight curve, and then if you uh, consider this to be some function, zero levels have some, some function, okay? And you try to apply the uh, level set uh, flow to this initial data. Then you see that uh, immediately the, uh, there's some like a non-empty interior region will develop. So this can be seen, for instance, so we know that, so, so if you have a curve in plane, and uh, the area of the curve, uh, the area of the region and and closed by the curve is going to decrease under the flow with a rate equal to uh, minus two pi. So if you approximate uh, this finger eight from inside, then you see the areas shrink with a rate uh, four pi. But you approximate it from outside, then you see the rate of the area uh, change is uh, minus two. Uh, two pi. So then there's a difference. So that tells you that must be some region with a non-zero area developed. So so this means that yeah. So there's uh, to the level set in gen, uh, in general could uh, actually flatten. So when it's flattened, then geometry is become um, not very satisfying, right? So you expect something like a hypersurface or a curve in plane, but then you end up having some region. Open set in you can space that's uh, oh, yeah. in, 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 I I I can't say the area. So then that makes the uh, when that happens, so then the level set flow kind of do uh, their geometry. I mean, so however, so there's the fix to that. So again, so the genericity play an important role here. So it cannot be a wide. But if you allow to perturb the closed initial hypersurface, then you can actually uh, make sure that the level set flow not fat and not develop a non-empty interior. So if that happens, then one can actually associate it to the level set flow uh, with the bracket flow. So by doing this, so you basically combine all the advantage of these two flows, right? So the level set flow, you could have this um, uh, pathological phenomenon, and also the level set flow in general don't have a compactness. And now the bracket, but it has the uniqueness, right? So now you have a bracket flow, which is leaf on this level set flow, then you inherit the uniqueness from the level set flow. And the level set flow inherited the, the compactness from the bracket flow leaf on it. So then you get uh, some pair of a bracket flow and level set flow, and that satisfies the uniqueness and the compactness altogether. So, so this is the uh, um, proof by Alice Brack and Tom Newman. Okay, so this is a, a two notion of uh, weak mean curvature flow um, that's uh, useful in our uh, later talks. And, but there are also other notions that uh, I didn't uh, have a chance to mention. So uh, for, for instance, so one could also uh, using this uh, uh, minimizing movement approach to uh, define the weak mean curvature flow, which is uh, like you, um, like something that like, uh, you know you discretize your time, and then for each time you are trying to solve some uh, minimizing problem for suitable uh, functional, and then you let the time step become smaller, and smaller, and take a limit. They're going to convert to some uh, uh, weak mean curvature flow. And another um, approach is uh, based on this Allen count approach that is again, you basically try to regularize this equation and then you take a limit 
uh, as the parameter go to zero, and then you see you get some bracket flow out of this Allen Hahn approach. So that's an other approach. So now, because we have this uh, weak flow, so then we can try to study how the singularity can be resolved, right? So before we have a classical flow, when it's become singular, then we can try to see the behavior of the flow um, when the singularity form, right? So now we have this weak notion, we can pass the flow beyond the singularity. So then we can try to understand the asymptotic behavior of the weak flow when it emerges from a singularity, okay? So we don't have a, a complete understanding uh, of that question as opposed to the uh, singularity formation. So, so in some special cases, we can say something. So uh, the case we consider is like, uh, suppose we have some uh, situation that we have some asymptotic conical singularity form. So namely, we see some uh, self shrinker that is non-compact and asymptotic to a cone at infinity. Wondering like, okay, so um, how this uh, cone-like singularity can be resolved uh, in the setup of uh, this weak flow, okay? So, so let's first uh, take a look at some uh, simple example that we know uh, in this setup. So, um, so, by work of uh, Yuman, so and later on um, uh, Qi Ding, so uh, we know that. Uh, so if we uh, restrict to dimension uh, n between two and six, so and we take a cone in Euclidean space with isolated singularity at origin, then one can find the mean curvature flow that coming out of this cone. So that's satisfy first, so uh, the t times less is uh, uh, rescaling of the time t equal to one less. So it's expanding. So as, um, you know, as t larger, larger, and you see that it's actually self-similarly expanding. Okay. And as t tends to zero, then you see that uh, this flow can work to this cone except at the vertex of the cone. Okay. So, and in this case, so we see the time t equal to one slash uh, self-expander, uh, right? So this basically says that, so if we start uh, some uh, cone-like initial data, which probably the simplest possible, you know, singular, singular initial data you can imagine, right? So, and then you can somehow find the mean flow. So, it is actually uh, smooth all the time, but uh, and approaching to the cone at initial time, right? So, so you can think about this way: is like you smoothing out the the, the 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 singularity which of the cone, right? So you aren't going to have a cone, right? So which is singular at the vertex, right? So now you coming, you have a flow and it's uh, smooth everywhere. So you can think about this LT is uh, resolve uh, the, the singularity of the cone at the uh, initial time, right? So, and so, uh, however, so uh, there are actually um, more than one way to resolve this singularity. So namely, so uh, here it is the existence of such uh, self shrink, uh, self expanding solution, but it could also other type of uh, uh, mean curvature flow that's uh, coming out of this cone as well. So the hope is trying to see that. Uh, so if uh, LT here is uh, mean curvature flow, uh, but not necessarily self similar expanding. So uh, can we somehow? see that uh, so when we examine this flow near the vertex of the cone, we see some self-similar self structure appear as we see when the we have that form. So uh, the difficulty is that uh, so uh, in the Huisken monetary formula, if you reverse the time, then you get weight going. So then everything is going to collapse. So then it doesn't make sense. 
So um, that's in, still inspired by that formula. So we try to consider some relative notion uh, of that so that uh, we can uh, still derive uh, this uh, monoticity formula. So then we can uh, get some, uh, get this blow up picture we want. So anyway, so 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 the so a first step is to notice that so uh, so the expander uh, as entitled to this cone uh, at a rate of uh, one over the uh, distance to the origin. So on the other hand, so if we consider two self expanders that are entitled to the same cone, so then it's the result of uh, Jacob Winston that. So these two self expanders is going to convert to each other at infinity with much faster rate, and is given by this uh, rate uh, x to the minus n minus one, and the times is an exponentially decaying uh, function. Okay. So so then so um, if we consider a hypersurfaces trapped between these two expander, then we can define this um, limit, which is basically the difference of this uh, 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 integrals uh, on this uh, surf hypersurface M and uh, this one of these uh, reference expanders. So, and we can show that uh, this exists, uh, though it may take a value equal to positive infinity as we don't impose any asymptotic, asymptotic uh, regularity on this M. So, and this limit is called the relative entropy. And this limit will be the uh, replacement of this uh, uh, Gaussian weighted uh, area in Huiskin's monetary formula. So, and this is the proof by uh, Bernstein and myself. And early on, so if one assume M it is also a self expander, then it's known by uh, Doriel and Schultz. And is there also, in that case, also show that the limit is finite. Okay, so using this uh, relative entropy, then one can prove this uh, monoticity formula um, that is a forward analog of the Huskins monoticity formula. Okay, so here we consider a flow uh, that's uh, come, you know, uh, coming out of this cone with isolated singularity. By the way, assume that uh, the flow is trapped between these uh, uh, two given disjoint self expanders. So this assumption may seem uh, some artificial, but it's indeed uh, in the dimension we're interested in, like uh, two be between two and six. One can prove that uh, this is uh, always true. So it's indeed uh, may not uh, not an uh, assumption. Okay. So so under this assumption, then one can prove this forward. Uh, analog of Huiskin's monetary formula. So the the right hand side is uh, is basically the same as you see in the Huiskin monetary formula, but with t zero equal to zero, and then you flip the sign of t. And then the left hand side, if you uh, write it out, you know, in term of integral over m, so then you see it's uh, also same, uh, exactly same as the Huiskin's. Uh, on the TSM formula. Okay, so, but uh, here is like uh, you subtract, subtract uh, something also big and make it every time we find that. Okay. In the same analysis as before, then we'll see that uh, the self expanders is going to uh, arise as the limits of the blow up sequence. So, as a summary, so uh, we've seen that the singularity is in higher dimension. Mean curvature flow are much more complicated than curve shortening flow. And self shrinkers that model uh, the behavior of mean curvature flow when a singularity forms, while self expanders model the behavior of mean curvature flow when it emerges from a cone like singularity. Okay. So, in the next lecture, I will talk about more about uh, uh, self shrinkers and so in, 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 in later lectures, I think Jacob is going to talk about uh, more about self-expanders. So I also want to mention uh, some aspect I don't have a chance to mention, but it's still important. 
So um, for instance, I didn't mention the mean carriage flow under uh, various convexity assumptions. There are actually uh, several reason uh, breaks through on that. So for instance, by this work, Andrews and Brandon Huskin and others. Okay. And I also don't have an opportunity to mention some uh, reason to um, progress on the classification of Asian solutions. So this uh, limit of flow, so um, in, in is they are actually um, weak, uh, they are actually bracket flow that exists for all negative time. So, um, so it's important to understand uh, the classification of these uh, flows. So um, under uh, various conditions, for instance, under some non collapse conditions, then uh, one can uh, try to uh, classify this ancient solution. So here I just mentioned some uh, works and you can refer, uh, you can also see the reference there. In. And at last, uh, so uh, I only talk about the mean curve flow in co-dimension one, but it's also um, natural question to consider flow in higher co-dimension. So even the curve in one three is exhibit uh, uh, several uh, interesting phenomena that's uh, significantly different from uh, uh, planar curves. So um, so here, I think uh, co causal recently has some uh, attempt to study this, uh, extend some theorem uh, in curvature flow in co-dimension one to higher co-dimensions. That's uh, also, I don't have time to touch on. Okay, so I think that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Are there questions? You mentioned a couple of times uh, genericity condition that are, uh, for generic, you can uh, avoid various uh, uh, kind of degenerate situations. So can you make these generic conditions explicit or is just oh. existence? It's a quite uh, explicit. It's a basic open dense condition. So, I mean, but can you like, formulate it in some, I don't know, geometric term? Like, what do you really need from a oh, certain so this, I don't know. So I, I guess uh, it's, uh, so for instance, I can't determine something is generic or not. I then see. I don't, that, yeah. 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 So you don't know. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Conjecture uh, related to the, class, uh, the classification mm -hmm. of the genetic similarities. Now you oh. already mentioned two. But in the example list, there are three. Why the oh, other two uh, the, is not included? Sorry, why is not why the other one is not included in the very beginning? Uh, so you mean the generic mean curve flow yeah, yeah. right? Okay, so the planes you mean? Yeah. So oh, okay, so uh, that's a good question. So so because uh, if actually a plane uh, arises at the uh, limit. So then uh, you can appeal to this uh, brackets local regularity theorem to see that it's not actually singular point. Okay. So uh, it is a singular uh, uh, imply that it's actually round sphere or cylinder, not a plane. Another mm -hmm. question here in the definition of the relative of entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow the, it's not Gaussian measure, it's a positive sign. Is potential in going back not here and oh. near the end. Sorry? Near the end. In the the, end. Near the end. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, because so it comes from this. So yeah. I, if I look forward, so so for instance, for instance I just uh, pick uh, the one, the, near the end, the relative. Yeah, so I would so from this slide, I will explain why the at the end is positive. Okay. So uh because if we look at the forward, so basically you do is like a, you change t to minus t. So so it's, so at the end I choose my t zero to be zero because I think a cone with vertex r n and as the t equal to zero. And now if I switch t to minus t, then I exactly get the t to the power n minus two and e to the power x squared. Okay. Well, another question is that. For the definition of relative entropy, mm -hmm. you only compare L minus 
Yeah. Uh, Why not uh, L plus? You can compare basically whatever L is. Oh, very similar. Yeah, so it's the same. Yeah. Okay. Yes, can, uh, no, in the chat, it was uh, that nice talk. And so, so <laughs> but I do have a question. Uh, so in the immanence result about the cones versus the, uh, the expanders that are asymptotic to, to the cone, mm -hmm. uh, you have a dimension between two and six. And yeah. Why is it only two and six? And uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's just because, so it's coming from this, uh, uh, minimizing procedure. And if you look at the self-expander locally, they are just like a minimal surface, but then in the conformal chain of the Euclidean one. So then uh, you don't wanna, if you don't wanna get something uh, with a singularity, then you restrict to dimension two and six. If you allow singular self-expander, then their theorem, I mean, you can, stated in all dimension, but then you say that the singular, singular set is uh, of the uh, co-dimension seven something. Oh, yeah. because of the existence of minimal cones and so on, okay. okay. Oh, yeah, because the expander mm -hmm. near singular point, you block minimal cone, so then, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. So in fact, the cones should not be minimal. In fact, that was yeah, my next yeah. question. Okay, <laughs> yeah. all right, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Yes. In that theorem where you're comparing a flow that's kind of stuck between two self-similar self-expanders, the flow MT was asymptotic to the cone. Mm -hmm. is, is it possible, is, must such a flow, is it necessary that such a flow, like, it must be known that there exist such flows that are wedged between self-expanders that aren't also self-expanders? Because it, it's, it's, if it's asymptotic to the cone, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily need to be self-similar? Yes, it doesn't need to be. Yeah. Okay. So actually, you say you have a suppose you have a two self uh, suppose you have a two self different self expander asymptote to some cone, and then so then you can actually so basically we 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 know like uh, so so suppose a priori you know that a, a cone support more than one self expander, right? So then then you can actually always uh, find some unstable self-expander because the self-expander is a critical point of some functional. And then you can somehow perturb your self-expander in a nice way that can actually construct a, some eternal flow to the expanding gradient flow. That's a, when time go to negative infinity is convert to this unstable one. And then when time go to the positive infinity it can convert to a stable one. So then in between, this must be something non-self-similar, but then the flow is actually asymptotic to the cone every time says, right? Any other questions? So in the definition, when you study uh, the relative mm -hmm. entropy, but uh, you more or less you know the asymptotic behavior of the A plus uh, self-expander joint. If, so if this uh, not cone convergence, mm -hmm. somehow a little more, Complicated. Yeah, yeah. So he, here, I, I guess the things get complicated is say your cone is not a, with isolated singularity. Say you could have a cone, then you plot some like a R factor, then you get uh, some, you know, uh, not, you know, accumulated the singularity, then then I'm not sure the convergence hold or not. The, the, you know, the rates here, yeah. yeah. So, because I think it's relies on, you have a cone, uh, so with isolated singularity, so then you, you know this uh, expanders as not to the cone, so then here you can write off as a graph one over another, and then you reduce to some PD, and then you reduce to some unique continuation problem, so then you can prove this rate. But then when you have a cumulative singularity, so I know there's some like a recent development, uh, in the setup of minimal surfaces. So, but uh, for, for, the, for the expander, I, I don't know. So then you definitely cannot uh, write a graph of one or another. So then it's more complicated. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, it, it would be interesting to consider that case as well. Yeah. Thank you. So, any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>